I became Muslim when I was a teenager, when I was um, 19. Uh, but I spent a lot of time thinking about becoming Muslim before I actually did. I think I sort of started seriously looking into Islam when I was about 17. Um, I'd been raised um, in a, a church-going family and I, I enjoyed that. I liked going to church. Um, but when I was a teenager, I just started to have questions that I didn't feel I was getting um, answers to. And so I started just to really grapple with my faith and question why I believed what I did. Um, and, you know, what do I really think is true? You know, I was convinced intellectually for a while before I was convinced spiritually or emotionally, I guess. And that, that sort of came later. And then when those two things lined up, I knew that that's what I wanted to do was become Muslim. Um, my family weren't overjoyed. <laughs> um, some family members were cooler about it than others. Some were really devastated. And so it took, a, it took a while for them to sort of come around and I guess feel reassured that it wasn't what they thought it was going to be. Um, but, you know, 13 odd years on, th things are good. They're, they're very cool and accepting about it. Women who wear the hijab are given more legitimacy, I think, in the Muslim community than women who don't. Um, and that's... Um, you know, I think that's really unfortunate because it's such a superficial way of looking at, at a person. Um, you know, the hijab is not necessarily any indication of greater piety or, or anything else, but unfortunately that's how it's viewed by our community. And I think also by the wider community, like, oh, there's a woman in hijab, she takes her religion very seriously. And that woman who doesn't, well, she's obviously this progressive modernist woman who, with Western ideals and those sort of things. And it's, I mean, it's a ridiculous dichotomy. Um, but I think definitely when you wear hijab in, in our community, um, if nothing else, I see this as one less thing for them to criticise me about. They've, I've already given them enough other things to, to criticise me for. And that's certainly not saying that I wear the hijab to keep them happy. It's, it's not about the community all, at all. This is between me and God. But um, definitely the hijab has a, a number of social functions for me. Um, and, that's, and that's one of them. Modest dress is important for men and women in Islam. There's, there isn't a distinction that women should be modest and men can dress flagrantly. <laughs> um, Islam as a religion values modesty in, in people um, in general. And I think it's, um, you know, I've heard it described different ways by different people um, that modest dress by men and women desexualizes the public sphere. So we're um, communicating and interacting with each other more as human beings and less as, as sexual objects. So I think I can, I can understand the merit in that as well. I think it's just seen that um, dressing modestly is, is valuable and is seen as a dignifying thing to do um, for, for people in the, in the community. But how modest dress has been understood is very culturally specific as well. You can see that when you travel through um, the Muslim world, and not just the Muslim world, but different communities that value modesty as well. It's interpreted very differently um, in, in different ways. And what's modest in one context is not you know, appropriate in, in another one. Um, but definitely modesty is seen as a real positive in the religion, not just in terms of dress, but in behaviour as well. Um, modesty is a part of the faith, an important aspect of the faith. And I guess to reduce it to just the way we dress would be an unfortunate reduction. I think the Australian Muslim community is extremely multicultural and there's a lot of good in that. Um, but there's challenges in that as well because um, everyone has come with their cultural understanding of how the religion is to be interpreted, which isn't in and of itself negative. Islam has always sort of adapted to fit the culture um, to, which it, to which it came. But it means that some people, uh, when first confronted with different practices of Islam, can be quite confronted and even horrified by what they see. So I think for us, you know, as an internal community, being able to uh, recognise that our tradition accepts these differences and just let it, sort of letting um, each other be while still trying to be a single cohesive community. Um, that's something that will be a challenge and also creating our own unique Australian Islam as well. Um, creating an organic Australian Islam that really belongs to this culture, this cultural context and understand this cultural context. It's not an external import that's just sort of been placed on top of the society here, but it's something that's um, indigenous to this community. Um, I think that'll be the biggest issue internally for the community. 
in Australia, things are pretty calm for Muslims until something happens politically or in the news and then there's this spike of um, reactions generally against Muslim women first and foremost. They're the ones who generally bear the brunt of negative community backlash. They're far more likely to be spat at or sworn at on the street or victims of road rage or yelled at or hit or anything like that. Um, I think for two reasons. One, because generally they're quite visible if they're wearing a headscarf. But secondly, again, because of this perception that they're weak. Um, you know, people who are looking for a target are more likely to go for the, the person they think is this weak passive victim who's not going to fight back than the big burly Muslim man with the big beard and <laughs> you know he's six foot five. Um, so generally things are fine and then something might happen either within Australia politically or overseas there might be a war there might be a terrorist attack um, the burqa ban becomes an issue in the media again and there's this spike in, in um, negative responses to Muslim women um, and then things sort of go back to being calm again so it sort of follows this almost like a heartbeat sort of graph. It's funny, I don't see myself as a representative for the Muslim community at all. Um, I see myself as a representative for me and I, you know, I know I speak in the media and that sort of thing but I only ever as this is what I think and this is just the opinion of my, one Muslim woman and I can tell you what some other Muslims think from speaking to them or reading about them but it's simply my perception and, and my beliefs and my thoughts. And I actually think that's a good thing because I think for so long we've had um, generally men speak in the community and this is what Islam thinks and this is what the Muslim community thinks. And it, it's just not realistic. None of these people were voted in by us. I never said I agree with what they said. So who are you to say you speak on my behalf? Similarly, who am I to speak on anybody else's behalf? I'm simply there representing me. And I think that's good because it shows the wider Australian community. There's diversity in our community. We don't all think the same things. In fact, often we'll vehemently disagree with each other um, and that's reality that's 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 the human story um, and so it's it can be tricky because even though I feel like I'm only ever representing myself you know I know I've still got to go back and then face the Muslim community after each media interview I do and they might not like what I had to say or the wider community might not like what I had to say um, but I guess that just sort of goes with the territory I find it really disappointing when I hear Muslims and non-Muslims say, oh, that's why are you allowing Western society to influence the way you dress with the way you tie your hijab or the fact that you wear that top with pant jeans or whatever, you know. It's such a, um, frankly, ignorant way to look at the way, you know, the, the trajectory and the history and the sociology of the Muslim community. Islam has always been influenced and influences the cultures in which it lives. So the way a Malay woman dresses who wears hijab is so distinct and unique compared to the way a woman in Turkey does or the way a woman in Nigeria does. They've always been adapted to its cultural context. And so it's no surprise to me at all that there's going to be a Western influence way that Muslim women will want to dress because that's their culture. They take the prescriptions that um, they feel the religion has in terms of what needs to be covered or how it's meant to, meant to be done and then do what you like. The, the restrictions on dressing actually are quite um, few. There's a lot of room for interpretation and so I don't, I'm not surprised by the Western influence of dress and I'm not um, disappointed by it. I think it's a really good thing. I think it's really, to me, it's a real sign of the way that Islam is becoming embedded within Western culture. You know, there are two billion Muslims in the world and I feel like every time I'm in the media they all want me to say exactly what they think and if I don't then they'll let me know about it. Um, so I, it can be really, I feel it can be very difficult to juggle the expectations or the desires of the Muslim community um, with what, uh, you know, presenting my message in a way that is accessible by the wider Australian community and also most importantly being true to myself, like not saying something that I don't believe or just being a puppet or anything like that, but saying, but this is, this is how I feel about this issue. Um, and I'm sorry if that's not how you see it, but this is what I think. Um, especially, it's, especially how when you're talking about matters of faith, because despite the fact that, you know, I, I do wear a hijab, so uh, an element of my faith is public. My relationship with God is very private and something extremely um, important to me. So to feel like that, is something that's being put under a microscope and examined and criticised by the Australian community and the Muslim community, that can be, um, that can be really difficult. My children are eight and four, my daughter's eight and my son's four. And you know, they've always been around what we've been praying and when they're little they'll, um, you know, they'll try to join in and you know, so often when I'll 
be praying my son will jump on my back and my daughter used to like run between your legs because they know when we're praying that we can't say anything to them so they're very cheeky but it's very cute too I have to say it's lovely when I'm praying and I feel my son just climb on my back and lean his cheek against my back it's it's lovely and there's um you know there's traditions um of the prophet as well that his grandsons used to climb on his back when he prayed so I think it's that's you know it's just a lovely part of our our tradition that you know you shouldn't be like get away kids I'm talking to God go and be quiet you know be part of it this is you know Islam is right in the middle of our messy existence and in terms of um my daughter wearing hijab again that's something that she has to choose for herself you know the hijab first and foremost is an act of worship it's an act of worship to God so I don't believe that can be um put on someone against their will it has to be if they're doing it to keep me happy then it's not an act of worship to God it's an act of acquiescence to mum and that's devo you know devoid of purpose um so you know I remember when she was in prep she um she came home one day and said I want to wear my hijab to school <laughs> and I said okay um right and I was I was really worried about her she's the only Muslim child at her school of however many hundreds of kids and you know she was only six she was in the first year of school and um, I was really worried about her I didn't want to say no you can't wear it because I didn't want her to feel that her faith was ever something to be ashamed of and then I didn't want to tell her why I didn't want her to wear it I didn't she at that age had no idea that someone wouldn't like her just because she was Muslim like that was just totally out of her frame of reference and I didn't particularly want to introduce that to her um, but on the flip side, I was really worried about her. I didn't know how the other kids would respond to her. I didn't know how the other parents or teachers would respond. I worried that they would think that we were making her, um, which of course wasn't true. And I, but you know, I, I would understand if I saw that and thought, well, why else would she be doing that? Because, but because her parents have said, you have to. Um, and so I sort of said, oh, well, you know, you sure? And she goes, oh, I really, really want to. So off she trotted in her short summer dress and her headscarf on that first day and I was so worried about her after I dropped her off that I just cried the whole way home. I was so frightened for her and I realised that um, all the things that had been said to me by strangers on the street um, that I thought hadn't bothered me, I realised I was carrying and I was worrying about them for her, you know, and I was thinking, I felt like I was sending her out to the wolves. I thought, I, you know, she's got these tiny, skinny little six-year-old shoulders and suddenly she's got this 1400 years of tradition that have just been put on her shoulders and the expectations that all these other people will have of her. So I was really worried about her and I worried about her all day. And when it was finally time to pick her up from school, I went to get her and she was crying. And I said, what happened? Thinking, oh my God, like this couldn't be any worse. And she said, I wasn't picked to take the class Teddy home. <laughs> And she'd totally forgotten about her hijab and it was just not a big deal like that was it. But it was just, um, it was a very funny end to the day. And she, um, and she, so every now and then she'll wear it and she said the other kids are totally fine about it. They'll sometimes ask, you know, why are you wearing it or, um, you know, what does that mean? And, but there, she, I, you know, I've tried to delicately ask, did the other kids ever be mean to you about it without raising the possibility? I go, you know, I just, I, what do they say? Or how do they respond? But she goes like, oh, why do you wear that? Or I really like that colour today. So most of the time she doesn't, just every now and then this inspiration pops into her head and she might wear it a couple of times a year. But I'm just really glad that her first, I just want her experiences of it, even if she never wears it as an adult, even if she never chooses to wear it, if nothing else, that her first experiences of wearing it as a child have been positive and her community has been accepting of it and she just sees wearing her faith externally as something that's okay, then, then that's enough for me. You know, that's, that's, as a mother, that's, I couldn't ask for more than that. And whatever decision she makes as an adult, that's, that's her own journey and that's between her and God. But I just feel such a sense of relief that if nothing else, this has been good. I think the emphasis put on hijab in our community and also I think the wider community is totally over the top. It is seen as like the sixth pillar of Islam for a Muslim woman. Um, and I find that just such a sad insult to our religious tradition that it's just seen as um, such an ultimately superficial thing. You know, it doesn't, if you don't wear a hijab, it doesn't make you not Muslim. It doesn't take you outside of Islam or anything like that. Um, and I think it's just sort of become, maybe it's symptomatic of the way our community sort of just looks at external labels and well, if you're doing that, then things must be good. Whereas that's not how our religious tradition worked and it never worked like that. You know, from the beginning, when Islam came, it was always something that was internally transformative, that 
the, so the prophet Muhammad spent years, when he first um, received prophethood, he spent years just preaching the oneness of God, years just on that. Nothing else was taught, not fasting in Ramadan, not don't drink alcohol, nothing, don't, not about hijab. It was just this concept because when that's really internalized and people truly grasp it on a deep spiritual level, the other things will eventually follow. But I think the problem for us is that we sort of feel like we do it in reverse, put the external things on first, start wearing hijab, don't drink, all those sort of things. And we try to change people from the outside in. And that is totally unsustainable. And it's, it's a, a really, it's a pathology, it's a hypocrisy. Um, to see that, to see the external as the ultimate expression of, of faith is dangerous. You know, you're building your house on, on sand external emphasis is um, so problematic in our community and also I think quite sexist because we place a lot more emphasis on the way that our women look than we do on the way our men look. Most people don't even realize that there are um, conditions or recommendations for how Muslim men should dress as well. But I think Muslim women, especially politically now, have become like this, this symbol of the way Muslim society should be. And everyone sees her as, as like the, um, the archetype of religious goodness. So as long as she's covering, everything's okay. And if she doesn't, then it's a disaster. I think I've always felt like a bit of a black sheep. Um, so not fitting in, um, I think I feel like I fit in in not fitting in. Like that is my space, the, the not fitting in space. And I'm okay with that, I think. You know, you know, I've always had friends and stuff like that, but I've always, always sort of felt a bit sort of on the periphery or a bit different to everyone else. And I don't know, maybe everybody feels like that. I don't know. Um, but I guess I'm just, um, yeah, I've always sort of felt like a, a black sheep in community and I probably will in, until I die. <laughs>